This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Yeah. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. It's about trout. Wild trout. This is Trout Bitten. This is the Trout Bitten Podcast, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Dominic Swintoski. I'm the owner of Trout Bitten and the author of TroutBitten.com. So we're halfway through season five, and I want to thank everyone who supports this Trout Bitten project. From the articles, to the shop, to the videos, and this podcast, all of this works because of you. And if you wish to support the project and keep the wheels turning, one of the easiest and most helpful things you can do is leave a comment and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, or at whatever podcast service you are using. That helps a lot. You can also use the codes that our sponsors provide on both this podcast and the website. And remember that direct donations to the Trout Pitten Project are very much appreciated. You can find the donate button at the bottom of every Trout Pitten article. So here we are to talk about fishing in low and clear water. And I have a full panel of experts ready with all the answers. Is that right, guys? Oh, yeah. Got them all? Oh, yeah. Experts in quotes. Can't speak for Bill. (laughs) In truth, there's always some element out there to make things difficult for us. It's the wind, the sunlight, the cold, high and muddy water, or it's low and clear water. We did a full podcast episode about these weather and river conditions in season one. Uh, We called it dealing with weather and fighting the elements. Uh, There are no sweetheart days, and fly fishing happens in tough conditions, so deal with it. Really, there are only a handful of days on the calendar where you can look back at the end of the day on the water and say, man, things lined up really well and the fishing was easy. It just doesn't happen often. So trout fishing, especially for wild trout, is often kind of hard. And these elements of weather and river conditions are obstacles to success that kind of get in our way. Now, many anglers get in touch with me for a guided trip and ask when the best time of the year is for fishing. But honestly, around here, We have excellent trout fishing year-round, and what matters most is the unpredictable elements of sun, wind, and those water conditions. That's what dictates the predictability of the fishing far more than what month it is. These trout eat all year long in our very consistent rivers. There's a ton of bug life, and the water rarely, if ever, gets too warm or too cold for these wild trout to feed. That's why they're tough, but that's why we love these rivers, too for the 365 opportunities and the four seasons of fishing. What will these rivers look like next spring? I don't know, but I can promise you they'll be full of wild trout that are eating every day. And success is just a matter of finding what might work for the conditions and for the moment. So tonight, with my friends, we'll talk about one of the toughest conditions we face. That's fishing in low and clear water. It's something that can happen in any season and in any trout river. Many anglers shrink from that challenge. They walk away or never even string up the fly rod using the excuse that trout are simply too spooky or they just aren't eating. But I promise you, that's not true. Trout are eating in these conditions. It just takes a calculated approach to bring them to hand. But it might not be easy. Okay, let me introduce my friends quickly so you can hear their voices. Actually, let me mention this. Many people have asked me what these guys look like. Clients ask me and I get emails. And if you go to the Trout Pitten website top menu under more, you'll locate the contributors page where you'll find a picture and a little more about each one of these guys. So let's start with uh, Trevor Smith because his picture is the most professional. Is that right, Trevor? Well, I think it's the subject. It just kind of exudes professionalism. Professional. It's a nice, like a clean nice headshot. It's a clean good. headshot. My wife took, took it. it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. All right. This is Trevor's voice. I was going to introduce Josh Darling next, but our buddy is missing. That's all right. He's out in uh, Illinois on a family trip. But I just wanted to comment that Josh's picture is also very professional. I think he modeled it after yours, Trevor. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) I do. And then there's Austin Dando. And uh, for this contributors contributors (laughs) page, he gave me a photo that is just a little casual. He's kind of laughing, and he looks somewhat kind. (laughs) <laughs> kind of happy, maybe approachable, right? Is that a good description maybe of that picture? Quite approachable. 
right? Quite approachable. Very approachable. Are you an introvert or an extrovert, Austin? Didn't hear me. <laughs> 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 no, I uh, I struggle with that question. That's why I. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. He doesn't He's believe gonna... in personality typing. <laughs> oh well. Why would we? Right? Who are we to assume? Sounds like yes. a very introverted trait. That's right. Day to day, it might change. Never mind. That's awesome. I don't voice. see personality. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you're free to change. Just want to let you know. <laughs> Around me, fluid. You'd be fluid. You be He's you. Fluid. Yes. Next, there's Bill Dell, who recently had me change his picture from one of him holding another big trout to one of him with a waterfall in the background. And I think this is his Tinder picture. <laughs> it's going to be, a, hey now. be my new Tinder picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. You're like, take that picture of, the, of me with the fish off of there. And here you I know, got this I thought, picture of me with a waterfall in the background. You know, That's thought, what happened. Like, yeah, I didn't want to show off with that big fish and everyone else was just, you know, this uh, modeling picture. Yeah. You know, so I felt like I needed... A more appropriate picture to fit the uh, fit the group. Mm. Maybe we need a trout nice calendar. Oh, nice. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, come on. We got six oh. months covered. Uh, yeah. How many months can those biceps fill? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Depends how zoomed in you are. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. All right. Lastly, we have Matt Grobe, hey, East yeah. Montana. <laughs> Matt gave me a picture for the contributors page, but which looks like he's uh, amused. Amused. But I no, am amused. amused. But you, did, you didn't. Right? You didn't get the. You didn't get the. Uh, the Dutton Ranch on the on the vest. No, I did. I saw did that. You? Like you're on the ra- right. you're on a ranch. You're wearing a Yellowstone coat or something. And not the yep. park Yellowstone, but the Kevin Costner. Yep. <laughs> Yellowstone we're, we're thing. On set, man. We were filming. <laughs> I was on yeah, set. Matt, yeah. You were part Matt, of the you, uh, Yellowstone. Matt, do you have a do you have a wiki is page sh- or a, is that uh, a wiki page or, or a, an IMDb page? Since you're a movie star now, <laughs> I was in a movie. <laughs> I was in a movie, the worst movie ever. Uh, I shouldn't say that <laughs> on here, what? but it was really bad. Um, but yeah, I was on set. It was actually 1883, which is the prequel to Yellowstone, the show. No, wow. I didn't know that. no kidding. Yeah. Little tidbit of info. If you watch you season you on it? Yeah. one, no, you won't see me on it. I was the site manager though, so all the oh. scenes in like episode, uh, I don't know how many episodes there were in the first season, but you, you'd notice all the snow cat peaks in the background of some of the battle scenes were shot at the ranch I work at. So yeah, man, it's really cool, cool, man. All those connections. All right, so hey, that's everybody's voice. Now you know, <clears throat> right? Let's do a listener question. And uh, Billy, you want to read this one? We'll try. Okay, so this question comes from Brian Knight in Columbus, Ohio. Brian writes, hello, Dom and podcast crew. I found your podcast a few weeks ago, and I'm binge listening to all of them. Hey, now. How did I miss Trout Benton until now? I've been reading many of the articles on your site as well, and I love the accounts of fishing when you were younger. I wonder if you guys might do a full podcast on fishing as a kid. Maybe tell some stories about the first fish you caught or the most memorable one. There you go. I like it. So that's uh, that's good. Thanks, Brian. I like this idea. We talk a lot about tactics, right? But that's part of trout pit. The other part has always been the experience. And the stories and our history, not just with one another, but with family and stuff like that. So maybe we'll dedicate a full podcast to this in the future. We we have done, you know, podcasts full of stories. I think one of my favorites is the the last one. It was right before the new year, was kind of, which is kind of you know your your reflective time of the year. We did that. We just it was memories and memories, yeah, and memories plans, on the water, right, and future that was plans. A good one. I like that. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, was that really last new year? Holy cow. It was. It was, yeah. And I'd like to do something this year for the last one mm. um, of this season. Something like that. Something similar. Uh, does anyone have a story about a first, I don't know, fishing adventure? It actually, it doesn't have to be your first one, but just something memorable. Um, maybe it's something pivotal that stuck with you over the years. You guys have anything? I'll tell you the most memorable fishing occurrence when I was younger. Mm-hmm. I have about a two to three acre pond in the backyard, and so I'd get down mm-hmm. there and fish for bass bluegill and carp and so i was down there as a young kid 
trying to catch carp and they wanted to eat. So I decided I was going to snag them. And so I picked <laughs> out the, uh, the biggest lure in my box with the most hooks. And that was, a a daredevil. And so mm. the daredevil had a trouble hook on the back of it. And so trying to snag this carp and it got stuck in the weeds behind me. So I twitched it really hard and yanked at it and it come flying out of the weeds and it ended up in the back of my neck. And I ended up going to the hospital to get it removed because the, uh, <laughs> the trouble hooks went in past the, uh, the barb, the barbs. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And so that's how old was memorable. <laughs> Uh, about 10 and so yeah, yeah. That, that'll leave an impression did you see burke's yeah. hand did you see pat burke's no. hand oh he fishes musky you know and he got did one he get, of those musky lures. One. Oh. Oh. it's nasty get him to show you the picture it oh. i said i said that's a hospital trip right he goes oh yeah he said he had to tell the doctor what to do he said the doctor seemed a little lost so i told him how to do it <laughs> i would hope they numbed his hand first i'm telling you it was nasty it's like yeah two of the so three the, hooks of a treble were in there mm, deep. he was hooked up to a fish and it, it you know it, it's what 40 pound test or something like that it, the line wasn't going to break mm. no yeah what do you say they the doctor they explained to me how to do it was basically they would numb my skin and then they would flip the hook around and push the bar back through my skin cut the hook and then kind of push right. it back through right yeah you want to be numb for that yeah <laughs> please but uh, yeah you could do please. it please bank side or in the boat right hey anybody else have a i don't know fishing story from when you were young a fun one no uh, yeah more fun one you know something impactful i think i alluded to this dom the first time you had me on last year um when i was a guest on the show but <clears throat> my v most vivid memory of the first time i picked a fly rod up was when i was 10 Mm -hmm. And I was on a delayed harvest stream, you know, late June. So you know what the trout populations are like back then. But we're we're gonna get into the low water tonight. But it was your classic low water summer, and yeah. those fish kind of pulled up into certain holes. And my dad was teaching me how to fish. Um, and at that time, it was just fly line, five x tippet, and a green weed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And lead wrap, no bead. And I just would, you know, I remember chucking that green weenie at the head of the pool and watching like those fish swarm that green mm -hmm. weenie, right? And they, they circle it. And I was at that. And then I finally hooked one, caught one, landed my first brown trout on a green weenie. Nice. But then I never looked back. I don't think I've ever picked up a, like a spin rod since yeah. then. You've you know? said that before. That, that, that always surprises me. You guys know I still spin fish once in a while with mostly with my older son there, Joey. I I have fun with it. When we go to the sure. beach, that's what I fish too. When we go to the ocean, salt water, that's what I'm doing. I enjoy it. I like kind of doing everything. When mm -hmm. I read this question from Brian, the first thing that came to my mind was it's not one moment, but it's it's how my uncle, he's the one who taught me to read water and kind of just so many of the things that have stuck. When we would get out of the car, there would often be people. Again, this is Western PA and stocked waters and there's the bridge hole. That's where everybody is. You know, I kind of assume we're going to fish there first. I assume, well, that's where everybody else is. He's like, no, we're not fishing there. And we'd go upstream. And that is one of the biggest impacts, I think, early on. He just taught me, it's one of the things that stuck with me the most. And it just maybe changed the way that I fish maybe versus, well, most mm -hmm. of the people at the bridge hole fished. I'm like, no, the goal wasn't to catch the most fish. The goal was to go have a better experience. Nice. The goal was to go see the woods a little bit, you know, and we would. We'd often see some animals. And he'd point things out to me. Oh, there's a black squirrel. That's kind of rare around here. Just things, other experiences. And I think, well, I know we were having a very different experience than the guys who just camped out at the bridge hole. We may not have caught as many fish. Sometimes I think we caught more fish because maybe they finally, they were spread out. I, I come back to that a lot. And I think about how that kind of set me up for, that's what I still do. I hardly ever just get out of the car and fish right there. And if there are people in a spot that I plan to fish, I'm gone. I'm out of there, man. And if you front end me, I might not look kindly at you, but I'm gone. I'm out of there. I don't, I don't want to fish beside you. No, thanks. I have a core fishing memory kind of uh, going back to the origin stories. My dad and I used to go on a camping trip every summer, and uh, we started that maybe second grade. And him and I yeah. were out fishing on, on a, a lake not far from here. 
and we stopped off on this island and this island had some rocky ledges on it and uh, he always fly fished which I never understood because I caught so many more than he did on my worms <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I was standing on this rocky ledge and uh, he kept warning me don't stand on there that, that could give away don't stand on there that could give away <laughs> uh -oh. you know, it's not gonna give away I'm like 80 pounds this is a solid rock whatever and uh, <laughs> sure enough I'm casting there and this rock ledge out of the blue totally falls away and i spin around back towards my dad and remember yelling dad and reaching out for him <laughs> of course he can't reach me and i fall straight in my back into the lake and uh yeah i learned my lesson that's great oh, man. That's, i remember that's thinking one. i remember experiencing like how uncontrolled it was or less safe you know than those controlled mm -hmm. environments of just being in the house when i was eight years old something like that is when we really started trout fishing on you know trout rivers trout water and i remember yeah. thinking a couple times like Hmm, I'm doing something pretty different here. You know, you could really get hurt. <laughs> I thought that was cool. <laughs> yeah, all the unknowns. I hurt myself. Yeah. I grew up fishing up on the Allegheny River in Warren, PA. And the Allegheny is a big river and there's a lot of mm -hmm. big scary fish in it. And we had the rear border of my yard was the Allegheny River. So I spent a lot of time growing up fishing and have a lot of interesting experiences and encounters with big fish from musky taking ducklings to catfish pulling my rod out of my hands into the water and mm -hmm. uh, big carp capsizing me in canoes on the river <laughs> and um, <laughs> i think i think all those experiences kind of feed into why i like night fishing so much now because there's this mm. kind of fear and exhilaration of of what lives in the water and how big is it and what does it eat and it's just mm -hmm. kind of fun there's a little bit of that trick-or-treat mentality that's just kind of fun when you <laughs> drink when you fish a big water that's good i like that do you uh have you night fished uh up there upper uh, no alligator no i'd love to i night fished there twice i couldn't get it going really and i just didn't know the water quite well enough i had fished it during the day okay but i didn't really get that chance to kind of scout it out mm -hmm. and think okay i'm going to be night fishing this that'd be one you'd almost want to drift don't you think right you could oh, yeah but i picked an island section that i had i had weighed mm -hmm. fished multiple times and it wasn't real real high but yeah it's always high yeah I mean, it's always mm -hmm. hardly weightable barely weightable even yep. at low flows anyway i felt like i chose good water i couldn't get anything going well let's um, let's do it sometime spooky though oh i'd love to just yeah keep right just a nice little drive as fly anglers and tires we understand the value of having the right tool for the job avidmax.com offers over twenty thousand products and the knowledge to help find the right tools for your job whether that be at the tying bench or on the water. Listeners of the Trout Bitten Podcast receive a discount at avidmax.com. Enter the code TROUT10, that's the number 10, at checkout to save 10% on your order. Orders over $25 ship for free, so you can put more gas in your tank or beer in your cooler. For all things fly fishing and tying, elevate your game with Avidmax. For over a decade, Smith Creek has provided innovative, high-quality fly fishing accessories designed to put your gear in easy reach, free up your hands, and keep our waters clean. This November, Smith Creek is releasing two new products just in time for the holidays. Check their website to see the new tippet holder. Each unit is individually machined from high-quality billet aluminum and anodized in one of two eye-catching colors. They hold up to five tippet spools with a patented, spring-loaded plunger design that is easy to load and keeps your spools right where you need them. All Smith Creek products are built guide tough and backed by solid customer service. To learn more about Smith Creek products, visit their website at smithcreek.co. All right, good stuff. So earlier in this fifth season in the podcast, in episode three, we covered spooky trout, what scares fish and how to avoid spooking them. And our discussion in that one very much sets up what we'll talk about tonight. Because spooking trout is always a concern. In fact, it's really a primary consideration. Find fish and then don't spook them before you fish to them. But that task is much more difficult in low and clear water. So I'm sure we'll talk more about spooking fish here tonight. Because the tactics we use in low water are very much predicated on the critical objective of not scaring the fish. But this episode, this discussion, is about how we fish low and clear water. What strategies, rigs, and methods work best for us in any season if the water is low and clear. All right, so let's start there, guys. I mean, low water 
can happen in any season, right? I mean, we kind of expect it here in the summer. There are certain seasons, certain times, even early fall. We kind of expect that low and clear water. We run into these conditions in like all four seasons, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would say, yeah, but to different extremes. Yeah, go ahead. I think low and clear water in the spring is different than low and clear water in the fall because in the fall, in most of the streams around us, it's extra low and extra clear. Can be. It's like another level. But like, I don't want to say all falls, but this no. one in particular and a few recently, yes, it's been the case. Yeah. Last fall was low and clear almost for all of the whole thing. And this is the lowest and clearest that I've seen it for the longest. It's been like this since July. Yeah. And I said, I'm kind of getting tired of it. But I will say I've kind of accepted the new challenge. And I'm like, all right, this is the way it is. And I'm going to learn something from it. I think it's kind of fun. But yeah, dude, I know what you mean. You can say it's low and clear in the spring, but maybe not this low. Yeah. Uh, But it was about three springs ago. And I was like, wow, this is low. I remember that first olive hatch. Mm coming and even the grano happened and i was like wow this is low water but i mean and you see in winter right i mean we there's been plenty of winters where you're like man all of the moisture that is coming is in snow and there it is still in snow there's definitely a difference between low clear water back east than there is out west you know austin you lived out here i mean the water is just so much bigger out here like even when it gets low and clear a lot of times that means it's just more weightable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, right? Um, yeah. I mean, there's certain streams that are that get super, you know, spring, the famous spring creeks in Paradise Valley, for instance, you know, they stay pretty much the same flow, but they're, to me, they're low and clear, right? So tactics that I might have to apply um, in a Pennsylvania limestone or in October when you guys are having low water could be tactics I apply to those mm-hmm. spring creeks if I'm fishing them. But overall... You know, if you're fishing tumbly brook or freestoners out here with a lot of flow, I can get away with more sloppy behavior, I mm. think, than you guys. You know, you guys have a more challenge mm. back there um, for sure from my experience out here. So you brought up something that made me, I wanted to ask this question. I feel like trout still go through the same rhythms and I'm really believing this right now because they're spawning. They're finally starting to spawn. I've seen the first few reds this week, early this week. And I feel like as I look back on it, the times when it's been low and clear in the winter, they still have that egg bite. They still eat the eggs. Low and clear in March. I remember it was super low. And while the bugs still came, the olives still hatched. uh, And they were eating the olives kind of just like they usually do. And right now, low and clear. And finally, they're starting to spawn. They got to kind of go through the same rhythms the same cycles right and i'm even seeing good streamer action in low Mm -hmm. clear water and so i feel like regardless of the water conditions in this case low they have to kind of go through those same cycles do you guys see that same thing skeptical of that? i think in the fall there is something to be said about the streamer bite yeah some falls it's good some falls it's it's terrible but the fish have to put on weight to generate yeah. the ability f- to generate eggs. The They have to put that weight on to be able to survive and to do yeah. to complete the spawn. And so the easiest way to do that is to eat some of the bigger prey that's out there. Yeah. Bigger food. That's a great point. And it could even just be a bigger nymph, Austin. I think they have certain rhythms. And like you said, a streamer bite. I remember last fall, Tom, you kind of touched on the fact we had some lower water. And I remember... Mm-hmm. Coming into peak fall, it had been low, struggling for any sort of flow. And we got our kind of first bump in flow uh, from a rainstorm. Mm. And it didn't bring the creeks up much. You know, maybe on my mm. local river, it gave me 50 CFS. But that little bit of difference gave the fish like this new found confidence. And oh, even yeah. though it was still technically low and clear, they were going berserk for streamers. And uh, mm-hmm. it was just to them like they felt safer than they had previously. And okay, yeah, we're going to eat streamers now. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Do you think that they preferentiate the night at all due to prolonged low clear conditions? I mean, I'm just thinking as a deer hunter, you know, these these hot, warm days, the deer are just kind of sticking to the nighttime because it's the safe time of day to be out. 
Mm. Um, and I'm just curious if the fish are kind of holding on to that nighttime pattern. Well, you see that, right? I mean, if, mm -hmm. when you're out there at night, if you're doing yeah. it in the fall, I feel like they held on to that summer rhythm, as I call it, as long as they could. And then yep. all of a sudden they're like, all right, we're going to eat streamers a little bit <laughs> and now we're going to spawn. Yeah. We're going to eat bigger food forms. Like you said, Biology Bill, it's kicked a, in. Yeah, I think it has to. Mm -hmm. And so we'll talk about this in a bit, but many people will say, hey, low water, you're going to have fish small flies. And a light tip, it's, you know, no big splat in the water. Or they're going to bolt. I'm not finding that to be the case. That big splat, I feel like some days it's a fight or flight yeah. reaction you get from the fish. They're either, they are, they're either going to, you know, scatter and say, screw this, I'm out of here. Or they're mm -hmm. like, no, screw you, I'm going to eat you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, fast mm -hmm. too often. Well, there's a yeah. there's a couple other things that go in hand in hand with this, and we've we've talked yeah. about it before. The okay. the water temperatures once again are becoming yeah. prime. Mm -hmm. Pressure is starting pressure. to decline, right? Mm -hmm. And the days are shorter, so there's just less time yeah. for pressure. Yeah. To to be distributed yeah. on the on the water. So there's other there's three other factors that come into play for those fish to right allow them maybe to get a little more aggressive. Good point. And regardless of the water depth and clarity, that's what I see, is that they're still going to go through those same rhythm cycles. Like Bill said, biology, man, it's got to happen. All right, so kind of along the same lines, I was just thinking this today, because again, things are low and clear. I'm guiding every day and I'm fishing. When the water is very low, and in this case, super clear, do you think the trout are extra spooky, even in the faster, deeper stuff? Now, Matt, you just said, like, you have like really low water out there, but then you still have big, chunky, fast runs. And we have maybe similar, but definitely different situation here. What we're calling big and fast it isn't as big and fast, understood. But I'm experiencing that here. And I'd like to hear what you guys see, first of all. You get my question, right? The whole, yeah. we're all saying, oh, this is low and clear. And yet, if you go to 5% of that river, you'll find deep mm -hmm. runs and heavy water where you're certainly not spooking fish. And it, maybe that water is a deep run up, white water even. And water might even be up to, up to your belt or something like that. Do you find that trout are still spooky, let's say, a little extra spooky or on the edge in that water too? The whole river I or just the flats? I think they're a little bit more, but I think it all yeah. comes down to a lot of approach techniques, meaning okay. if the sun is up and you're casting a shadow, you don't want to cast that shadow across a riffle that you're trying to fish because in that case, 90% of those wild fish are going to tuck underneath a rock and not be interested in eating after that shadow cast across the water. I don't think they're like, if it's a hard, heavy run where they have cover and they feel secure... I don't think that they're extra spooky, but what I would consider is the lack of holding water around that area. So there's nice. probably a lot more density of fish in those hmm. prime lies. And when you do approach it, like Good Bill point. said, it's going to be a lot easier to end up spooking fish because you're going to be coming in contact with more than what's normally there. And then like we talked about during the spooking trout episode, that Paul Revere effect they can travel up right through the pod or whatever is there. And, and all of a sudden the, the hole turns off and you don't really know why, because you, you hardly That's got nice. there yet. Yeah. I, I'm with Austin on that. I think, I think the fish are acutely aware of what conditions they're in at the moment. And so mm -hmm. if they're sitting in a low clear area, I think, I do think they're aware of that and spooky, but for instance, I mean, the fish we fish for at night are sitting in low clear mm. water sometimes and yet lack any sort of inhibition, you know? Yeah. And so I think they're, I think they're very aware of the lie they're holding in and, and how vulnerable they are in each individual line. So uh, yeah, I agree with you, Austin. I would say, I think you can get a little bit closer to those fish, at least what I'm envisioning Dom describing those shallow riffles that are, have the broken surface. I would prefer approaching that type of water, you know, with a, with a tight line tact, I can feel more confident that if the sun's in my favor, I can wade a little closer to those fish as opposed to a gentle glide pull because yeah. it's less broken. Like, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so those are two different types of like low clear water where I might have two different approaches when I'm walking up yeah. the river. So my buddy, I was guiding and, and my buddy asked me, well, 
you you know, we recognize that these trout are more spooky. And he said, however, I can get like 15 feet away. You're telling me I can get 15 or 20 feet away as long as I stay behind these trout in this heavy run. And he said, like, are these trout just as spooky as the ones down there that we had to stay 30 feet back from? And it was in a just gentle kind of riffle. And my, that made me, you know, kind of scratch my head. And I was like, well. And then I said, yes, because just the day before, we'd fished not a real heavy run, but a run. And we caught a fish, caught another fish, and then caught a, hooked a third fish. And it was big. And it had jumped a couple times, made quite a bit of commotion, but still in some moving water that normally I would say wouldn't really spook everything else around, but it seemed to. And this is not the only time that kind of thing has happened, in this fall especially. And it just seemed, to, from that point on, I mean, we didn't, we didn't move another fish. And we should have been able to move more because we just caught two. And then we hooked a big one that jumped. And it just seemed to just break everything up and everything's done. Again, like I'm saying, that, that run normally you should be whatever a fish jumping shouldn't spook the fish that were five six or even 10 feet up above we couldn't catch another fish in that run for the next 30 no more than that more like 50 feet to the head of it and i'm saying run you'd look at it and you go those fish won't be ultra spooky when Mm -hmm. one fish jumps it just seems like every the whole system is kind of on guard i feel like when it is low and clear they migrate more to structure Mm-hmm. and whether that be rocks, logs, or whatever, and they're holding tighter to that. And so your casts have to be more accurate Nice to pinpoint like, okay, here's the log. And one thing I do is try to cast less. If it's low and clear, I'm picking out spots that are nice. like, okay, I think this is the prime spot where I think there might be a fish. And so I'm going to start my cast there instead of, you know, being low and clear, you have a better chance of spooking that fish. If you, you know, you make 10 or 15 casts to work your way into that juicy spot instead of saying, okay, let's, let's, let's take a minute and let's analyze this run and say, okay, here's the best chance to catch a fish. And let's make that my first cast. That's a great point. And you kind of move into the tactics here, which is really what we want to talk about most. That's good advice. Cast less. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dom. Let me ask you this: So you had that mm. scenario that you caught three fish and you feel like you spooked them. Yeah. What about you? Fast forward two months, mm-hmm. mm, three months. You're in January, okay. and you're okay. in some of those winter holes, and you can mm-hmm. rip out twenty five, thirty fish in the same right. low clear right. water. So what gives? Well, I don't know. I mean, we're really low and clear, Matt. And if it would be that low and clear, I think we might have the same result. That's my working theory at the moment. This is different. This is a little different. And I think by winter, I sure hope we'll have some more water in the system. And I'm, I'm with you. You could, you know, get a couple dozen fish out of there sometimes. Really in that same run that I'm thinking of. Yeah. I don't know about a couple dozen, but 10, 12, you know, and some of them will jump and, you know, cause plenty of commotion. You can't get them backed out of there before they seemingly would spook the others. But under average conditions they don't and even under let's say kind of just regular low conditions it doesn't seem to it goes back to are you fishing two three four five feet of water this is this was probably four feet yeah okay yeah so i would think at that point four feet i would think a fish would be comfortable enough that right it wouldn't expect prey to like an eagle or something or a heron to come down and try to try to attack it no i agree and it's one of the deepest areas in that Oh, honestly, it's one of the deepest areas for miles around. So I was kind of surprised that happened. And again, it's not the only time I've seen that happen. It's been on different rivers this fall where I've seen like, man, wow, they really seem to be on guard. Um, another thing I was thinking is we know they migrate uh, just because that fish, that fish that jumped, let's say he was 16, 17 inches. It was a nice fish. That doesn't mean he's going to live in there all day, all week. He probably is going out at night, you know, Trevor, going to the, going to the mm-hmm. side. Picking yeah. on some bait fish uh, later in the day. The, many of the hatches are mostly over. I'm not really seeing spinner falls of olives or anything like that. But, well, whatever. He might move it out into the shallows, out into the tail out, different lighting conditions. You might, might say, I'm, I'm going to go downstream. Might be wanting to chomp on some nymphs in a, in a heavier riffle or something like that. I don't know. I mean, I think they do migrate um, within the day and certainly day to day. And so they know what the rest of the river is like. And I don't think they even need to migrate over there into the shallows to know what it's like. Like you said, Trevor, they know their surroundings. 
Mm-hmm. I just think they're more on guard all over, all over. It doesn't matter. If, even if you're in the heaviest run of the whole system, I think they're still spookier or more sensitive. Mm-hmm. You think it could have anything to do with spawn? Like it, it self-preservation could. during this time of reproduction or something? I don't know. You tell me more. I mean, I, yeah, I'm open-minded about that. I don't know. Maybe during this time, you know, at the time of the year, they're thinking about reproducing and, and creating more of themselves. And if something even uh, casts doubt that it could inflict fear or it could take their life or something, they're going to react by just, you know, shutting down. But in, again, in those harder runs, you're less likely to find those maybe those fish that are going to spawn at least in this time of the year. So I don't know. It could be something feeling fatherly. They're making responsible choices. They're, (laughs) they're growing up. But then again, (laughs) right in this low clear water, you kind of get into this, some more of the tactics. I mean, the streamer bite's been pretty good, especially, you know, on cloudier days, but even today it was sunny and there were times where it wasn't bad at all. You kind of went through spells. Well, and Trevor, you'll back me on this though, real quick. Mm -hmm. When those species are starting to spawn, Austin, I agree with you to a certain point, but then they lose, especially the males, they just lose all sense yeah. of everything, right? And then they have one thing on their mind, and we've all been there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? You get like, protective or whatever you want to call it. You get it. stupid. <laughs> I mean, you can get really <laughs> stupid, and you, you actually, mm-hmm. you know, expose yourself more so during that time, right? That's when all <laughs> yeah, the big literally. bucks fall. And yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that part can be can be kind of interesting that, you know, they kind of lose mm-hmm. that and get dumb. Yeah, I mean, and, to that to that point, you know, in, I was in the woods on Saturday and we spooked a particular eight point a couple times in a about a three-hour stretch and he kept chasing hmm. does back past where we were, knowing full well or should have known full well where we were. Any other time of year, he would have been gone for good. And yet mm. the effective that testosterone is quite potent. Hmm. <laughs> I think that's really neat to have that hunter's experience. Mm-hmm. And uh, all of you guys hunt, yes. And, you know, my limited once hunting a, experience. Once upon a squirrel time. soup. <laughs> squirrels, baby. Squirrels. <laughs> I beat up on the squirrels. But no, I, I think it's really neat uh, because you bring stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, just have a broader perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Good point, Matt. Whether it's after a fishing trip or at a backyard fire, you can bet the Trout Bitten crew has a case of New Trail Broken Heels along with us. It's honestly our favorite beer. This hazy IPA is smooth and full-bodied. Hand-selected citra hops lead to notes of bright clementine and juicy ruby red grapefruit. Broken Heels is a keeper. New Trail Beer is proudly brewed in Williamsport, Pennsylvania and delivered cold to your favorite craft beer retailer every week. At New Trail, it's not about being the best angler. It's about getting out there. So enjoy nature's moments and reward yourself for a day well fished with New Trail Broken Heels. It's Trout Bitten's favorite beer. Precision Fly and Tackle is a family owned business with a passion for the outdoors and a sense of adventure. They are anglers who enjoy every moment spent on the water with family and friends. Precision Fly and Tackle carries the widest selection of Euro rods, reels, lines, leaders, flies, and accessories. From the beginner to the advanced angler, Precision Fly and Tackle can outfit every angler, no matter the budget. Visit them online at precisionflyandtackle.com. Then use code TROUTBITTEN10, that's the number 10, for 10% off your order. Gear up with Precision Fly and Tackle for your next adventure. So you talked about streamers and flies. Mm-hmm. Do you guys think the the fly size matters when it is low and clear? Um, yes and no. Yeah, I was going to say, I think if, uh, I guess it coincides, I'll just say one example. The fall coincides with low water, but it also coincides with a pseudo-cleon mayfly that's very <laughs> prominent in the system. Nice. And Back to the pseudo-cleon. Uh, but it's, just but I, I downsize, it. right? So it's like, the 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 water the bugs get smaller in my opinion it, when you're matching the hatch as the season progresses and the water gets yeah. thinner yeah. and so is that I'm just trying to match the hatch right right nothing else like the low clear water is not influencing my fly selection mm-hmm. as much as the actual insects I think that's 
perfect. I mean, that's how I feel about it. If you have low and clear water during the sulfur hatch in April here, April and May, I'm still going to fish the sulfur. And if that sulfur is a 14, that's probably what I'm going to fish. Right now, I do find I'm catching more fish on bigger food forms. Hell, that could be a mop fly. It could be a bigger stone fly. It could be a small bugger, relatively small. I'm saying like a 12 or a 10 bugger. It could be a streamer, mm-hmm. and lots of times it has been lately. They, I think they do want to fatten up. They are quite, they're, they're, they're a little skinnier than I am used to seeing them at this time of the year, right yeah. before the spawn. Like I said, I feel like they've been kind of waiting for a little bit of water, and now they're, they're finally gone. All right, that's not going to happen. Let's go. go. Yeah. Yeah. I like that though, Matt. What are they eating? I mean, right. what's in the system? That's what I'm, I don't, I right. care about the water, but that's not my decided right. factor. If though. you have low clear water in April, I'm, I'm like, you know, chomping at the bit to get out there yeah. back home and fish the Hendrickson hatch, right? Like, right on. And that's yeah. a, right yeah, I mean, that's 12, a, there's your example. 14, like, a 40, lot of yeah, fish yeah. rise when the water's low. Like there's pros and cons to yeah. it. You know it. And so there's something to point out. I mean, there are absolute yeah. advantages to a uh, low water. Yeah. If you give me low water and a sulfur hatch and they're going to rise to mm. them very consistently throughout the river and not just individual extremely peak lies that they could be in yeah that's a fun evening with their rising all throughout the river one of the things i've been telling my clients is like all right look it's low and clear but i'm telling you they're going to eat we got to be obviously not spook them but the advantage here is first of all you can wait it easily and we mm-hmm. aren't even going to bother with 75 percent of this river sometimes 80 or 90 percent of this river we're going to no. go fish yeah. this stuff why because that's where they are because we know where they are <laughs> in this low and clear water. Now, I will say they are definitely starting to spread out. They're, they're no longer in that summer rhythm, as I call it, just mm. in that more predictable stuff. Yesterday was a day where they were, they were eating in knee-deep water, if you could find it, but not the deepest, greenest holes either. Mm-hmm. But still, you have so much less of that knee-deep river right. at this time of the year. Sometimes I feel like it's the shooting, it's the fish in a barrel syndrome mm-hmm. where you know where they're at. and so. Yeah when it's low and clear, but your presentation has to be good because they could be spookier. You get less chances, but you kind of, you can kind of isolate where those fish are. Yeah. I think that's an important thing you brought up there. Yeah. Phil, you get fewer chances. So you have to cover more water. Mm -hmm. And I kind of find myself saying two different things to people. I'm saying, well, we're going to have to cover a lot of water. And then I'm also saying, be careful in this water. Once you get there to that spot, yeah. well, you mm-hmm. got to be careful and make that yeah. first cast the best one and try not to spook, you know, the Paul and do, do the Paul Revere thing. Once you're there, you got to, you got to be careful and make the most I, of it. But then you got to cover a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. This weekend I fished some mountain streams. And so oh, it was, wow. it was 10, 15 minutes sometimes of climbing over logs, working yeah. my way to a position. And if I made a bad cast, but looked like I threw a stick of dynamite and fish went everywhere. (laughs) I was screwed and I was walking another 10 or 15 minutes. And so you kind of have to, you know, work yourself into that position and take a minute and think about, okay, where do I want to make a cast? Where do I think I can spook the least amount of Mm -hmm. fish? But where, where can I feel like the first cast is going to catch me a fish? I love that. Yeah. And that type of fishing, it can be disheartening because of the amount of ground you have to cover for something that's, you know, somewhat of an average piece of water just to get to it and hope you can do something with it. But, yeah. you know, what a great argument to, to knowing your river really well. You know, I think a lot of folks who don't know their water or know their local rivers, they know one or two accesses and they, they can tell when they get there, nothing around here is very deep. I can't fish. Yeah. But, you know, if you, if you explore your rivers and you know them, you know, very in depth, you can have a, you know, five or six at least different accesses where you could even get back in the car and drive a quarter mile up the road and go after it again. Um, so, yeah, yeah it's, it's not necessarily that you have to struggle through everything in front of you. Uh, you don't have to do that. You can go pick the, the good stuff and cherry pick a little bit in that, in that scenario. Nice. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think, I feel like you've written about this, Dom, but what better time, too, to learn some of the subtleties of the bottom structure in your rivers mm-hmm. than low clear conditions where you can find depressions you can nice. find structure you can find things that you just sort of the rivers laid bare you know and you can you can sort yeah. of mentally log away some of those spots that under better flows are going to really probably be prime lies and hold hold some bigger fish yeah 
Oh my gosh, I've been fishing water that oh, I haven't waded maybe mm-hmm. ever, and maybe yeah. maybe once or twice. I've been like, well, what's in? Wow, what's that's pretty neat. Isn't that? Weird? I never knew what was in here. That's cool. And, yeah, and then you're gonna memory bank it for the rest of your life because much of that is permanent structure, rocks that, that aren't gonna move. Right, I like yeah. it. These are advantages. Another advantage I'd say is I find it a lot of fun to fish streamers and be able to see the streamer the whole time. We all like that. Yeah. Who doesn't, mm-hmm. Right. When it's, you know, higher and dirty water, you often can't see your streamer. Even if it's 10 inches below, boom, it's out of sight. I'm seeing my streamer all the time and they're eating it, you know, and I think that's, that's, that is, that's a lot of fun. And it's educational too. It's great to see what your strips and your jerks and your jigs and whatever, your rod motions and line hand motions are really doing to your streamer and how trout respond. That's really neat. That's another advantage of, you know, fishing this low water. Um, that isn't the case all the time. I, often I'm like, mm. well, I, I got to stop trying to see my streamer because it's, it's riding too high when I do that. So listening to you talk made me think of something um, <clears throat> with the low clear water. What... Do you think there's any correlation between the spooky fish dom that you're you're encountering now and the fact that most of the year that limestone water has a murk to it and yep. there's another sense of like cover and maybe that's BS, but like as it's you, shock. the angler, that's are looking, true. you know, and then it loses it, right? There's a point where it's probably not as chalky as the low clear water in the spring, maybe. Yeah, I agree for sure. I think the fall and the winter, that chalk reduces in the river. It does. It makes it, it makes it more difficult because it's, it is so gin clear Yeah, that you can just see everything and they can see everything as well. Probably way more than we can. Yeah. Almost everything. The guy I was with today kept saying, I can't see him though. I can't see him in there. I'm like, I know we almost never see these trout unless until you spook them. <laughs> right. Well, there's a riverbed thing though, right there that kind of hides them. We got, mm-hmm. yeah, there's always something on the rocks, you know, the mossy stuff or the algae stuff. And just that we don't, you rarely get those sight fishing opportunities. And there is still a little bit of that green murk that you're talking about, Matt. It's just, it's always, the, even in this, what we're saying, super clear stuff. Sure. It's not as clear as the stuff that you have out there. Speaking of spring and fall, do you guys see any correlation with, the tippet size you can get away with um, in low clear water based on the seasonality of things? Like, do you find yourself fishing smaller tippets in the fall more so than the spring? Or, I, I mean, for me personally, I kind of what you were saying, Dom, we match the hatch accordingly. I kind of match the tippet size to the flies I'm fishing. So if I'm fishing those small pseudo Cleons, I'll fish them on 5X, you know, maybe 6X. But I'm not, you know, if I'm going to be able to to fish a, a prince nymph and get eats on a size 10 prince nymph, I'm not going to fish 6X tippet. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going to fish 4X tippet, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't fish anything under 6X. I don't have any, I don't own anything under 6X. And I will rarely even use my 6X, even in low clear conditions. And I don't, I mean, truthfully, I go to smaller tippets when I'm using smaller flies to balance my rig. And, I, and certainly in low clear water, I do go to smaller flies at times just because, as we've mentioned, seasonal hatches. Um, but I don't feel like I find myself going to six or seven, you know, or wanting to go to seven X just from a sight perspective, you know, to not spook the fish. I was going to say, yeah. Like, do you think it, that's a spooking fish? Like, do you think four X tippet right. would no. spook fish now as opposed to six X tippet? Right. I think that's way overblown. I think uh, it's a wives' tale or it's a myth, right. really. I, I don't do think, think trout are. Leader shy or tippet shy? Go ahead, Trevor. No, I agree. I think, you know, if you break that question down a little further, Mm -hmm. you know, a stiffer tippet and a heavier tippet is going to be more sensitive to your, yeah, I don't know, amateurism in your drift because Mm -hmm. it's going to transfer more of the motion from your rod tip into the flies. Accidentally almost. Yeah, Yeah. so maybe you're getting away with a little bit more movement in your rod tip and and play in your drift if you're fishing 5 or 6X. Definitely. Um, yeah, so maybe maybe that's where the advantage would be in lower clear conditions where they can truly see that nymph coming from as far away as possible. Nice. Um, so I think there's an element there not to be ignored, but I, but I don't think it's about seeing the tippet. I think tippet, to me, plays more into the rate of sink rate. 
Yeah. Meaning yeah. if I want to get flies down, I'll go to less tippet. This weekend I fished low clear water and I fished kind of a, a dry dropper style and I fished one X to the caddis, which was my dry. One X. And did you really? One X. Yeah. Oh, oh I'm and sorry. To your dry. Gotcha. Yeah. To my dry. And because my dry was like a size 10. And so I wanted something to yeah. push that yeah. dry fly out and cast it well. And, and so I had a longer leader. I had maybe a 10 foot leader, but I still had one X tippet on it. And then yeah. my dropper was three X and it was, you know, super gin clear water, but I still caught there you go. fish when I could get to the pools. But it, to me, it was more about taking the time to okay i want to plan where i want to cast this mm -hmm. when i got to that hole the fish didn't seem to care about whether it sunk four inches five inches or whatever they were more interested in the kind of stimulator fly that i was fishing mm. that's a great example it's just neat to hear your accounts of that and i'll do kind of similar things i know austin you've talked about that you, you just you test stuff out and why not just try 3x if everybody tells you you got to fish 6x, go ahead, try 3x. <laughs> and then you might go, oh my gosh, I caught just as many fish. I kind of keep that 6x in my back pocket, so to speak. Matt's saying he matches the, uh, you know, the fly size to the tippet. And uh, Trevor's saying a very similar thing. That's pretty much what I do. And then it, if it's a slow day, I'll go, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just run everything real light, real small, see what happens. I kind of do, we'll do the same thing with the leader. Sometimes if I'm running a mono rig, I'll go the real skinny these days. I just, okay, get everything as thin as I possibly can. I'll go down to 6X, light fly, do the whole thing. And then, honest to God, it hardly ever changes the outcome. And I, I fish it well. And it doesn't usually change things, but I can kind of eliminate that question in the back of my mind where I go, what if I did go to 6X? Would that make a difference? I'll try it. It usually doesn't presentation does and i think what bill is saying it kind of keeps coming back to me what he's saying is being planned with your delivery be cautious again we get back to don't spook them and yeah in this low clear water you don't have as many shots i think uh you you just hit it right there with the presentation depending on like you and bill your, your quality of your drifts are very high so maybe between three and six x the ability to put a natural drift through a lane is not going to vary very much depending, you know, how thick your tippet is. Now, if someone who's just starting goes out and they try to get down with 3X and still make it look natural in a, you know, some different water, it may be a lot harder for them than it would be on 6X. Yeah. So, again, presentation is king, certainly over the, the tippet size. I agree with you that they're not tippet shy, but, you know, they're poor presentation shy. Right, So I right. think depending on the angler's experience a little bit also dictates what you can get away with and be successful with. Right on. That's a downward spiral, though, too. <laughs> you know, take the extreme. What if you're trying to learn on 8X? <laughs> it's probably not going to work out sure. too well. You know. And you're going to you're gonna mess up. Like, if you're trying to, if you're trying to throw 8X. Yeah. Yeah. A long distance or trying to get that to unfold. And look. Yeah. Like it may be a thinner tippet, but if you're throwing a crap cast with 8X, <laughs> right. but if you throw, <laughs> yeah, if you throw that crap cast with 3X, it may unfold and give you more. Might not be so crap. More. Yeah. yeah it may not be so crap. <laughs> Maybe. Everything works sometimes, doesn't it? But if you right, get, if, right. if you're out there, right. And you have one of yeah. our listeners go to the central PA area now with the low water yeah. and they're thinking about tactics, right? Mm -hmm. Like even if you went down to 6X, okay, let's, let's yeah. say that it was somehow magically going to give you a better presentation. The root <laughs> of the spooked fish is you catching mm. one fish in the hole, mm -hmm. right? So does it matter if you have three X on or six X on because at the end of the day, the fish that you just caught is probably going to cause more damage than the tippet you're using. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. There's so many other factors. It point. could be because you didn't paint your face, yeah. Matt, that, that all those fish are spooked. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> a little throwback there for you. There you go. Tying it all together. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, Hey, we should mention this, um, upstream, right? We're mostly fishing upstream. We dealt with this a bit on the spooky Always. trout, right? It's got to be upstream. What, mm, I've seen, I was walking my dog the other day, and then a, a, a day later, I was going for a run on some of our favorite water. We've all fished it a lot, and I saw about five fishermen each day. Everybody was fishing across from themselves. I mean, low water, 
The sun was up. I'm like, you guys, I, I felt bad for every, every person. I'm like, you are not going to catch a fish. I would bet money <laughs> you are not going to catch a fish. You are fishing across from yourself. The one guy was, I don't know what he was doing downstream, but he, he had kind of a short line. He was fishing like 20 feet, maybe 25 feet downstream of himself. I'm like, that is impossible. You will not catch a fish. <laughs> and I can almost promise, you know, promise you that's not going to happen. Upstream, it's got to be upstream. Yeah, good point. You got to stay behind him. We've talked in the um, past about holes resetting. In that, in that situation, mm. in this time of year, how long do you think it takes for a hole to reset? Mm. Longer, right? Mm, Lower and clearer, day. longer. Next day, Bill says. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or nighttime. Nighttime will reset or, yeah. everything, I think. Interesting. Yeah, next day. No, do you think so, Matt? Yeah, I mean, yeah. A long no, time? I mean, uh, I think it just depends on the the situation and back to how safe do those fish feel and if they feel yeah you know like i said low and clear water can mean different things in different watersheds oh, um, yeah and yeah. so we're referencing low clear water you know in, in in a lot of these famous central pa streams and those fish are probably pretty darn scared right now right they're 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 <laughs> their covers on edge ex, yeah their covers uh being exposed and so i would agree with you that it might take a little while for those fish to feel safe again. Yeah, we haven't been seeing many anglers out there, as expected, really. But when we have, um, over these last few weeks in this guide season, I've been saying we are not fishing behind that guy. Sure. We are, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to relocate. I am not, we are not going to yeah. refish the same water, even an hour later. No, thank you, because there are plenty of opportunities where those fish have not been disturbed. And to me, that's of primary importance. It, just like we're fishing upstream so that we're not spooking those fish before we get to them. Yeah. yeah. That's an important some that, tactic. Some of that comes. Yeah. 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 And a lot of it comes from observation. Like you have to pay attention. Like I saw uh, Timmy fishing this stretch and I'm not going to fish that stretch because, you know, I know he was through <laughs> there. Teddy Instagram, maybe. Teddy was... Instagram, you know, even if he didn't catch any fish, just walking through that stream, yeah. he's going to spook them. So this is good stuff, guys. Um, Let's do let's do this. How about if we kind of go somewhat rapid fire on uh, uh, on the different tactics? Let's say nymphs, streamers, and dry flies. And you know, do you have tips? Let's say, what are your best tips for nymphing in low and clear water? Anybody? So one of my favorite things to do, uh, we could probably do a whole podcast on it, but uh, floating the cider. Um, and what I mean by floating a cider is it's on a, a tight line rig and your, your cider section, you, you grease with some sort of paste or mucilin and uh, you, uh, you cast at a distance. And the thing to understand about when you're floating a cider is you're not necessarily floating flies uh, of any significant weight. You're floating the, the slack between you and the flies. So, and the reason I, I mention that is because our focus often in these, in these low, clear conditions is not necessarily really long nymphing drifts. They're often kind of short because you reach the bottom somewhat fast. Um, so when we're fishing a, a floating a cider, we're not looking to drift 20 yards as we may look to do on an indicator rig. Um, so the reason I like to do that is because there's very minimal um, disturbance upon the water other than the flies entering. Um, the uh, cider lands very softly and it's a good indication of anything intercepting your flies. Now, you could also do something similar with wool and uh, you know, use a, a Dorsey or a yarn indicator like that. Um, yeah. But again, the advantage in my mind is that the drifts are short. You're reaching the bottom sometimes very quickly mm. and wool isn't going to extend your drift or add uh, anything in my fishing that a, uh, a cider on its own landing very stealthily would. So that's one of my go-tos. Two things. Did you, first of all, did you see Trevor's eyes light up when you said wool? I did. I felt it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Program. The wool master. He kind of sat up straighter in his chair. Like, it what? moved. Wool? wool? Yeah. Wool. <laughs> Second of all, so Austin, you're saying that you're going to cast further away, and that's why you'd be floating the cider, but your drift itself may not be all that long. Yes, absolutely. Gotcha. I like it. Good strategy. Are you also saying that too? Um, just to clarify, Mm -hmm. Are you also saying too that that yarn 
you, you don't need necessarily the flotation of the yarn because you're not asked again you don't really want a long drift exactly so, i'm not yeah. asking for flotation it's more or less i'm asking for something to indicate a strike on nice. a short drift that um to me just having a cider on the water is a little less spooky than maybe dropping something else even if it right is on. something as light as yarn on Saturday, I, I hit a stretch of water that is my favorite on our home stream. I knew it was going to be super low. It is the lowest I've ever fished it. And I went up in there, and uh, there was still lots of uh, the algae stuff on the bottom. A lot of it's turned from green to brown, and it's just waiting to be washed off. I mean, it was low. And I did some streamer stuff, and I got a few hits. And then the sun eh, was kind of in their eyes, and that's my excuse for why they stopped eating streamers. But then I floated the cider, Austin. And, oh, it was not lights out by any means, mm -hmm. but I caught more fish and I felt like I was in control of my drifts. I felt like I was doing what I wanted to do. But I would say, I realized that if I tried to get more than, I'm going to say 10 or 15, 15 feet of a drift, I'd be like, that's it. Get it out of there. Put it back in. I mean, I wasn't trying to do too much. And when I stayed disciplined like that, stayed far behind the fish, about 30 feet, put it up in there, float that cider, things are dropping, 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 exactly. recast. And it, right. You're fishing a slow drop. Once in a while, I'd have a fish. Let me ask you guys this too. Should we, I mean, are your expectations lower for like fish count and catch rate in, in low water? Typically, yes. No, I catch the same amount of fish all year long. <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> no matter what. I catch 100 fish every time I'm out. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, my expectations <laughs> are lower. Yeah. My expectations are lower too. Yeah. I just think that's fair. You, you know, I, I kind of, I accept, not only accept the challenge, I kind of enjoy it. Yes, it gets old after a while, right? But, you know, if I catch half of what I, let's say, usually do, I'm like, that's pretty good. I'm kind of proud of myself. <laughs> Pat myself on the back a little bit. I did all right. I did all right. So low water strategies, I'm at whatever tactic I can get distance out of. Right on. I usually split that between dry dropper and streamers, depending mm -hmm. on the day. Nice. Streamers, I'm trying to throw a streamer that I can throw for distance. Mm -hmm. the streamer I can throw for distance, I don't want to throw a four millimeter bead with 10 rafts of 0 0.30 lead. Mm -hmm. It's going to sink to the bottom. Too heavy. And so gotcha. I want to yeah. fish a streamer that's going to be kind of heavy that I can throw at a distance, but it's not necessarily going to sink fast. Often that's on a mono rig because the mono rig, I can keep that line off the water. And so the line off the water means... Yeah. Like if I were to throw it with fly line, that fly line would hit the water and that's more uh, surface disturbance than it would be if I were to throw it on a mono rig. Sure. And so the mono rig gives me the ability to keep that line off the water. You talked about um, this when you said you were fishing the Grinch, for example. I remember that. Yeah. I think it was the Spooky Podcast. And that's an interesting concept. You said the fly wasn't very heavy, but the materials held water weight that allowed you to cast that rig with this mono rig at that distance. Uh, yeah. I, I love all that. I think it's important. I've been fishing bigger food forms, as I said earlier in this podcast, and some of it is stuff like a mop or stonefly, just to get that distance and then no sag in that tight line rig or inconsequential sag, let's say. Yeah. I've been fishing a drop shot quite a bit. And then with that drop shot, I can decide, well, maybe I don't want a bigger food form and I will test the theory of, hey, you got to fish really small point. flies. I find that People arrive with different assumptions, expectations, and habits. And they'll say, well, I've fished size 20s and 22s a lot. And if we're not catching them, uh, I'll say, well, let's tie some 20s and 22s on. <laughs> and then maybe then they, kinda, they refocus and dial them back in. But anyway, I, I've been doing that every once in a while and then putting that drop shot on to get that distance. And then I'll still get you know, the 20s, a pair of 20s, yeah. let's say. That's a nice strategy in the low water too. A lot of times I'm fishing dry dropper and I'm fishing kind of an unweighted dropper and I'm fishing a light, maybe 14 or 12 caddis or something that I can throw at distance. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm analyzing my situation and determining like, okay, I think maybe the tail out of this is going to be good. So maybe I'll put two casts on that and then I'll say, yeah. okay, well then there's a rock sticking up here. And so I'm going to put a cast or two there and then I'm going to say, okay, I'm done. Now let me throw it to the head of the pool. And not necessarily just like constantly just pounding that water because with fly line, there is more mass and it yeah. does cause more surface disturbance. Gotcha. I like 
throw in the fly line to get that extra distance, but boy, you got to be careful what you do with that fly line, especially if you're fishing, you know, flatter water, as we've acknowledged. Yeah. Spook and trout, it comes back again to spook and trout. I love fishing dries. I kind of said that it's like the summer rhythm was extended into this fall season. But right now, I can no longer try to force feed them those ants, for example. That, that ant bite, that they're not hanging out on the banks anymore looking for ants. They're really not. And the caddis, they're just not eating. And I can go all day and see two rises, and maybe one of them is a fall fish. They're just not eating on top very much. And so I can't really force feed them those dries, but I'd love to. And in the summer, I've said before, one of my favorite things to do is let's go. Low, low clear water. I love it. I'm going to feed them the ants and the small caddis and whatnot. I like that. That's another advantage of low clear water in the summer. Gives me that chance to do it. But boy, you got to be careful with not just where the fly line is, but obviously where the leader lands and all that stuff. It's important. So tactically speaking for nymphing, I can remember some of those challenging times back home. And I know one tactic I would use was eliminate the beads if I was tight line nymphing hmm. and just yeah. do lead wrapped, whether that's a waltz worm or um, a pheasant tail. I feel like the disturbance, Bill, you just mentioned disturbing the top of the water. I think you can disturb the fish in general in that low clear water with the size bead you hmm. might have and that kerplunk. And they're yeah. more susceptible to spooking in some unnatural way. Whereas if you're fishing um, just the lead wrap bodies, they enter the water column a lot more subtly and sure do. You can potentially catch more fish that way. When I was talking about the drop shot, I mean, I become very aware of there's your Kaplunk. I mean, it can only be a drop shot that weighs 30 centigrams, which again, is like a size 14 fly, mm -hmm. be bead head fly. And still it goes plunk. You know, whatever you want to call it, a little pop. And, yep. and <laughs> Sends fish I'm like, going. Oh. It certainly can, you know, and if you cast the right way and then, you know, up above them enough and you got to get it down, maybe, right? Maybe you don't have to get it down is what you're saying. Do you ever cast above where your ideal situation, like, so if you're throwing that kerplump, do you ever cast that, let's say 10 feet above it and kind of, yeah. you know, with that drop shot, you can work it into the, the mm -hmm. spot where you think you're going to catch a fish. And so you're, if you think, you know, this four by four circle is where you're going to catch a fish. Yeah. A lot of times I'll plan my cast to throw it beyond that. Right. Prevent hitting where I think the fish are and then kind of, you know, drift it or guide it into that spot. For sure. Yeah, that's good advice. I like what you guys said about balancing kind of weight and pattern. I, I'm definitely in agreement. Some of those, you mentioned the mop fly or maybe even a stone fly with chenille. I like having a pattern that's going to ride, reach the bottom, but not necessarily dive to the bottom and not necessarily be as prone to just sinking like a stone, you know, the opposite of the mm -hmm. paradigm effect. Um, so I, I, it's certainly something that I'm thinking about when I'm nymphing. And it may even, it's a time of year or a condition in which I may fish a smaller mop or a smaller stone fly than I typically would, mm -hmm. um, but still with that same kind of body style that kind of hugs the bottom but rides that cushion more easily right on um, and both of those flies have that water weight built into the nymph sure. <laughs> it seems slight but man it's it, it's a big deal even it like a, big deal. a heavier dubbed even a waltz worm you know has a little bit more water weight than a pheasant tail absolutely hey anything else guys the one thing i'll say is if i know it's going to be low and clear i kind of plan to be on the water very very early like oh, as yeah. soon as i can see or later at night or if i know it's going to be an overcast and cloudy day i may key on that and so if i have the option of fishing you know i'm gonna fish no matter what but if you have the options always pick you know low light situations whether yeah. it be overcast skies and it's gonna it's gonna reduce some of the impact of the low water but it's still not gonna make things gravy Nice. And in addition to, you know, picking the, the right light conditions, think back to the areas that you normally can't wade or you normally can't ever mm. touch the bottom of when you're trying to fish it normally. And those are the areas you want to go target this time uh, mm. of year when you have these conditions. Don't go for the stuff that's normally calf deep and expect it to be calf deep <laughs> still because right. you're not going to be yeah, pleased. Yeah. Go search that stuff that's really gnarly and uh, you'll find fish holding there. Yeah, absolutely.
Bill, your point about the light, I mean, that's it. Two days ago, it was nice and cloudy, even a tiny bit of rain that didn't amount to anything, but rain. And it was good fishing. Almost the same area, mile upstream. The next day, sunny. And I was like, go away, son, go away. And, <laughs> you know, I, it wasn't even one quarter uh, of the production as the day before. And that's just, it's it. And you can overcome a little bit of that if you understand and know a river because you can say, okay, mm -hmm. if we fish here in the morning and I know the sun is going to come up yeah. and it's going to be here and it's going to cast shadows. So I'm going to fish what I, what, you know, what is going to be sunny at noon. I'm going to fish it at 6 a.m. And then at noon, I can go to this side of the river because I know it's going to be shady. Yeah. But once again, it is hard to beat Dawn. If you want to be a good fisherman. Yeah. Get up before dawn, get out at dawn. And right now, that's not so hard anymore. What's no, dawn? Seven thirty yeah. right now? Yeah, it's for the cupcakes now. I mean, you get up at seven o'clock. <laughs> we are yeah. about to get daylight savings, then yeah. all of a sudden dawn yeah, will be a little gonna, earlier. It's gonna get real now. <laughs> it's for the cupcake season. <laughs> cupcake season. It's cupcake season. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Sometimes I'm a cupcake. I was pretty good this summer. I was getting out of dawn, getting out of dawn. I felt good. And then I go through my cupcake spells. Hunters, man, you guys, you guys got to get out of dawn, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Before an hour before light, typically you want to be in your stand. That'll train Everybody's you. got different strategies, but yeah. What's the other strategy? Uh, you walk in at daylight with the rest uh, of the schmucks and spook all the deer for everybody <laughs> <Right>? else. <laughs> I, thought, <Yeah. laughs> I thought you'd have a smart ass comment for the other strategy. <laughs> Be a cupcake. That's the other strategy. <laughs> the other strategy is you drag my deer out of the woods. <laughs> you help me drag my deer. Nice. Hey, buddy, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. I got this deer. You want to help me drag him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just got here. I see you got up at 8 o'clock. You're fresh. You can help me drag this. That's right. <laughs> There's nothing left for you. All right. There it is. Everything you need to know to catch every fish in the river, even when the water is low. <laughs> All right. The truth is, low and clear water is a difficult challenge that many anglers will simply skip over. They'll wait until flows improve because some believe that trout simply can't be caught or they just aren't feeding. But if you accept these river conditions as a chance to learn and improve, the extreme, the sensitive nature of trout in low and clear water will force you to refine your approach, to refine your cast, and to refine your drift. Everything about your presentation must be thought through. Success requires caution, planning, and a willingness to strike out. But that's how you become a complete angler, by fishing when it's tough and by fishing hard. All right, we're halfway through these fall episodes of season five of the Trout Pitten Podcast, and we'll be back next week with episode seven. Thanks for your support, everyone. Austin, will you read us out? So remember, the Trout Pitten Project is a free resource for all anglers. The Trout Pitten website hosts over 900 articles with endless stories, commentaries, tactics, tips, and more. Find what you like through the top menu and through the search page. Navigate by way of the categories and the tags too. Be sure to find the Trout Pitten YouTube channel, currently featuring the Trout Pitten Tips series in collaboration with Wild Media. These are short, useful, and unique tips for your fly fishing life. Thank you for listening to the Trout Pitten Podcast. Please give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and leave a comment, because it really does help. Until next time, friends, fish hard, enjoy the day, and find your life on the water. Far more than what month it is. Who did that? That scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I had a bit of a crash. Bit of a crash. <laughs> hey now. <laughs> Boom. Trick or treat. Back to the pseudo Cleon. I'm just trying to match the hatch. Everything works sometimes, doesn't it? It moved. No, thank you. <laughs>